Thank you for joining us today. If you have a prayer request, please feel free to send it to Abundant-Grace.com or you can mail it to us at P.O. Box 3693 McAllen, Texas 78502. We're located at 2110 South McCall Road in Edinburgh, Texas. We are near the corner of McCall Road and Freddie Gonzalez Drive. Well, if we want to think of who we are and what our mission is, uh, we can't take any glory for it. We're just the donkey delivering the message. But then on the other hand, the donkey wasn't crucified either. (laughs) After he went into Jerusalem, he looked out over the place. And the, the word of the Lord says in Luke 19, 41 through 44, Jesus wept. That's the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Why did he weep? The Bible tells us that he wept because they did not know their day of visitation. And they stoned the prophets and the wise men that the Lord sent to them. And they were stumbling at the cornerstone, which was Jesus Christ. Now, after that, Jesus was so moved that he went into the temple and purified it. Do you remember that? He took some cords and made a whip out of the cords. And he looked around in the temple and he was so disgusted. And he took that whip and he began to drive the money changers out. And those that sold doves and turned over the money changers tables. And for a few minutes, it was total chaos. And so when they started picking everything up, they came to him and they said, what are you doing? Who gave you this authority? He said, haven't you ever read in the scriptures the zeal of my house hath consumed me. He said, this is what God, what I'm feeling from God, this is how he feels about the way you're conducting business. This is no longer a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. Now, if you go back and read the book of Daniel, you will find out that Daniel knew what God was doing. He had sent the people into captivity in Babylon and it was predetermined they would be there for 70 years. But Daniel, being an old man at that time, was taken captive into Babylon probably when he was a teenager, maybe about 15 years old. And so... 15 years old plus 70 years of judgment, that makes him about 85 or maybe 90. And he was still learning what God was doing. And he read the works of Jeremiah the prophet. And Jeremiah said that it was 70 years determined for desolations or destruction. And the temple was destroyed As Jesus prophesied, there was not one stone left standing on the other in that temple, but the whole temple mount was nothing but rubble. And that's what Jesus said would happen after he rose from the dead. And in 70 AD, not 69 and not 71, but in 70 AD, Titus, showed up with his Roman army and he laid waste to all of uh, Jerusalem and Judah. So when Jesus purified the temple, that was just a foretaste of the judgment that was coming. Jesus 
has a confrontation with the religious leaders about who gave him his authority. That's found in Luke 20, verse 1 through 7. Now, Jesus was preaching and teaching and casting out devils. And somebody told him, you better get out of town because Herod is going to kill you. And he said, come here. Go tell that fox that I do heals and cures and miracles. And the third day, I'll be made perfect. Oh, whoever got that prophecy got something. But it just went right through them. He gave them a parable about the householder and the death of his son. Now this was a parable spoken against the religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the doctors of the law. And he gave them scathing rebukes. He was always confronted by the traditional religious system. Jesus was not didn't have one inch of religion in him. We beheld his glory, the Bible says, as the only begotten of the Father, full of truth and grace. Another confrontation with the religious leaders about paying taxes to the Roman government. And he said this to Simon Peter. He said, Simon, who do the conquerors collect taxes from? From their citizens or from the foreigners of the land that he's conquered? And he said, well, the foreigners. He said, then the children of of his kingdom are free. He said, that's right. But he went on to say, lest we offend them, go down and put a line in the water and take out the first fish you catch. In its mouth will be a gold coin and give it to the tax collector and that'll be enough for you and my and me. He gave them signs and wonders to reveal himself to them. They came and they said, well, one of the... Uh, Pharisees said to him by night because he didn't want anyone to see him coming to Jesus. And he said, Lord, we know that you that you are a just person, you judge rightly, and you must be from God or you couldn't do these things you do. But Jesus responded to him in an unusual way. He said to him, after that kind of an introduction, he said, you must be born again. The man said to him, how can a man be born again? I mean, enter into his mother's womb and be born again. He said, you can't. What's born of flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Therefore, he said, you must be born again. Then he gives some examples about how the born again experience when the Holy Spirit is moving in someone's life. It's like the wind. It comes, it goes, it does its thing, and we're left changed by what's going on. Now, they brought him a coin. And they said, Master, tell us, should we pay taxes to the Roman government or should we not? He said, you hypocrite, show me the coin. And they held it up and he said, whose name and inscription is upon it? And they said, Caesar's. And he said, here's your answer. Give to Caesar what belongs to him and give to God what belongs. 
The account of the widow and the two small coins. He's got his disciples with him. They're teaching in Solomon's porch. And when the the afternoon uh, prayer is over, they come back through the temple area and there's an offering box outside. And as they came in and went out, many wealthy people dropped large offerings into the offering. But there was an old widow who came and she had been there for the hour of prayer. And when she left, she had two small coins. She put them in the offering. I did a little word study on that. And the two pennies, the, the two coins made up a fraction of a penny in our money. And Jesus said to his disciples, you see that widow woman over there? She's put in more money than all the rest. They have given out of their abundance, but she is given out of her need. Now, some of those offerings were quite large, Jesus said himself. But it was out of their abundance. And they didn't give it the way it should have been given. You know, Jesus asked for giving him everything. How about the rich young ruler who came? And he knelt down to Jesus and he said, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I'll tell you what, that's the question of eternity. And Jesus looked at him and he loved him, the Bible says. He said, well, how do you read? What does the scripture say about thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not have any gods before me. Thou shalt not commit adultery and so on. And he said, Lord, I've kept those commandments from the time I was a youth. And Jesus, the scripture said that Jesus loved him. He said, if you want to be perfect, sell what you have, distribute it to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But he went away sad because he had great wealth, the Bible says. The problem was he didn't understand the part about when you give it, you'll have treasure in heaven. You see, what Jesus was offering that rich young ruler was an apostleship. He would have been he would have been one of those that was preaching the good news that the Messiah has come. Your sins are forgiven. And whenever he needed to draw on that heavenly count, he would have it. That's how, how Jesus wants people to identify with him. He said, if you love your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, children, more than you love me. You're not worthy of me. So that talks to me and it says, I want you sold out to me. I tried to deal with the Lord many years ago. I wasn't interested in going Uh, In the ministry, I had a business. I had a new home. I was living in a resort area. And uh, when we got saved, we started going to church. And you talk about people that uh, hear voices. What do you think they call those? Schizophrenics, that's right. But the voice I heard... (laughs) was in my heart, not in my head. And I said, Lord, I don't know whether I'm supposed to do this or not, but he said, I said to him, 
Well, uh, if, you, if, you, if, if it's possible, just let me stay in this business and uh, in this community, and I'll go to church and pay my tithes, and I'll help missionaries. And after I had prayed and commit that to him, he said to me, I don't want your money. I don't want your wealth. I want you. He still says that to people. He gave another illustration. He said, take a farmer, plow in his field. If he lays his hand to the plow and turns back, he's not fit for the kingdom of God. The religious leaders questioned Jesus about spiritual matters and then did the same to them. And after that, the religious leaders never asked him any more questions. Uh, They came to him and they said, Master, there were seven brothers. And uh, of course, Jesus was born of a woman, the Bible says, under the law. And that's why we don't have to fulfill the law. Jesus fulfilled it for us. And uh, they said to him, there was uh, seven brothers, and um, the first one married a wife, and successively they died off. And finally she married the last brother, according to the law, And uh, he died also. Says, but in this resurrection you're preaching about, whose wife will she be? He He said, you do greatly err. Not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. He said, it's written in your scriptures that he is called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All three. He said, he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. When they came looking for Jesus' body in the tomb, the angel said to them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Well, he gave them the right answer. He said, they erred in their scripture knowledge. And they didn't know the power of God. That's the power to raise from the dead. And then he asked them a question. He said, I'll answer your question if you'll answer mine. They said to him, okay, ask. And he said, whose son were David... who, who?" Who was the son of David? And they said, he was, who is the Messiah? He said, he's the son of David. And he said, well, the Lord said to my Lord, come and sit down at my right hand while I make your enemies your footstool. If he said that, then uh, how could he be the Lord and the Messiah at the same time? That was the, the translation of it. The account of the widow, uh, we talked about that. The prophetic word about the destruction of Jerusalem. I'm not going to be able to get all the way through this But I'm going to save it for another time. But I want you to, uh, Lord, we're going to take this time to allow the Spirit of God to search us. It says in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. 
that sticks in my mind all the time. All the time. I don't lay down to go to sleep at night that I don't think about that verse. Because you and I have no promise for tomorrow morning. Today's the day of salvation. If we're going to get it right, it will be today. So we'll be ready for tomorrow. I've thought about how many good things the Lord does for us continually. And as I was listening to those William Branham testimonies and listening to how he ministered in the service, he would call somebody up, anybody, the third person on the fourth row, he'd say, stand up. And, uh, you didn't come down in the prayer line so we could pray for you. But he would say to him, uh, the Lord tells me that you have such and such a sickness or disease and you've gotten a bad report that you're not going to live. But you're ashamed of the way that you've been living. And he said, God will give you a sign. He said, will you get up and come down here and agree with me that God will let me know what's holding you up from receiving your healing? He said, your name is such and such. You live at such and such an address. You have so many children. And I heard the woman scream out in the background. And she just fell on her knees. And he said, the reason why you didn't come is because you don't feel worthy to receive from the Lord. <laughs> well, there's lots of people in that condition. But Jesus said, come unto me. Regardless of how you feel or how you look to yourself or look to other people, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I'll tell you who that belongs to. It belongs to every sinner that's ever lived. Because the way of the sinner is hard. And I think we were all, we've all been there at one time or another. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, because I'm meek or humble in heart, and you will find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Wherever you are, Whatever stuff is going on in your life, the invitation is still good. Whosoever will, Jesus said, let him come and take of the waters of life freely. He told his disciples, listen, freely you have received. Now it's time to freely give back. We identify with the work that he did on the cross. Who did he do it for, Bob? That's right. All of the people. We were all sinners. There's none good. No, not one. Christ died for the ungodly. I'm going to put my hand up. On that one. Because until I, that realization came into my heart, I didn't know I was lost. Without hope, without God, lost in this world. And something else I found out. I needed a Savior. 
but I couldn't do it myself. But I found Jesus. Better said he found me. And he took me in. And he washed me. And he clothed me with a robe of righteousness. Not my righteousness, but his. I identify with him through the blood and the body. Let's partake of the bread which represents his body. Thank you, Lord. After supper, he took the cup saying, drink ye all of it. I'll not drink it again with you till I drink it anew in the kingdom. There's only one element in all eternity that purges sin. There's only one element in the universe that can cleanse a conscience. He said in the book of Hebrews, how much more shall the blood of Christ cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? I tell you what, you might say, you don't know what I've been through and where I've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. It can be cleansed. It can be forgiven. And you can be translated out of your darkness into the kingdom of light. Let's partake together. Well, I want to bless you before you go home. Let's stand on our feet and take a hand next to you. I'd like for our prayer partners, if you would, please, to come on down. And if you have needs in your life you would like someone to pray with you about, you got questions about what you should do, our prayer partners will be down here and we'll be glad to pray with you. Say it with me. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you. Be gracious to you. And show you his favor. And give you his peace. Now all the folks that are going to be on the road today going to family activities and graduations and all that. The Lord give you traveling mercies. And we'll see you back Sunday next. We dismiss you in the name of the Lord.